Today I'm going to be reacting to the Ed Milet podcast featuring Layla Hormozzi. I think it's one of the best podcasts I've ever seen. So let's just get into it. What do you look for in a company you guys want to acquire or partner with that you think? Is it is it the jockey or the horse? Is it the business or the person running it? Or are there specific things you look for in both of them? For me, what I've seen play out over time is there's a few things, which is like one, if you can get it for free, there is a cost. It might not be money, but there is an absolute cost. And so I think there's a lot out there of, you know, you can get businesses for zero money down, all these different hacks and tricks. And like, honestly, I haven't seen that play out any well for anybody. So first thing that comes to mind is social media, right? We are the product because if it's free for us, it is coming at a total, total, total cost. So let's keep going. I just, you know, wanted to throw that in there. The biggest thing, Ed, is I absolutely put the jockey first because what right. I've seen time and time again is the person that's leading the business, the one that's controlling everything, like I can bring in a new team. We can do a new strategy. You know, we can change the product. We can change the sales. We can change the marketing. We can change everything. We just can't change the person who's running the company. And so what I've seen time and time again is like our entrepreneurs who have blown up the companies that we've invested in, they're the right jockey and they're able to steer in any direction that's needed. And that means that we have changed the strategy a lot. The person that was leading the business was so adaptable and so resilient that he was able to become, or she was able to become, whoever they were, whatever they need to be to grow the business. And I think mm -hmm. what I lost sight of when we first started investing was like, why have I been successful? And I think right. what I really always pinned it on is like, I'm willing to do what's required. And if I realize there's a deficit in myself, I don't get sad. I don't dwell in it. I just say, how do I fix it? So you have to be willing to adapt. Everybody knows the story of Blockbuster when Netflix offered to buy them, partner with them early on, and they said no. They wanted their model to remain, and then we all know what happened. I'm sure that CEO at the time was very proud and didn't want to change things and wanted to keep doing things the same way. Look where that gets you. What is it on the failing entrepreneurs that you see most of the time that causes them to blow it? I thought about this a lot. I think... Mm. The most common thing, and I can tie this back to, essentially, for each quarterly, I have the CEO rate themselves or the founder. And when I looked back, this wasn't even that long ago, and I looked at the ones who had failed and we had divested from and the ones that were succeeding, the ones that had failed had all rated themselves higher than I rated them. Interesting. The ones that succeeded all rated themselves lower than I rated them. A really, really, really incredible leader is willing to continuously learn. Doctors become board certified because they keep up with all of the latest knowledge and information. They didn't get their doctorate in 1985 and then never study ever again after that. And I think by the nature of growing a business, you have to be open-minded and you have to be open. I would say like strong beliefs loosely held. I would say outside of that, you know, they can't manage their weight. They can't manage their marriage. They can't manage, you know, how they show up for their team. They can't manage their emotions. And so they're just this, this, and because they're like this, the business goes like this. I think of Chef Charlie Trotter. I just watched the documentary Love Charlie on Netflix recently. I saw somebody that was absolutely remarkable at creating a craft and revolutionizing the world in fine dining and Michelin star caliber restaurants here in America. And at the same time, he was unwilling to continue to grow when he reached the proverbial top. Made a lot of decisions that continued to revolve instead of innovate. And I think of Grant, the three-star Michelin chef at Alinea in Chicago, who surpassed Chef Charlie Trotter and he was able to innovate. He was able to take something that nobody was doing and turn it into something. And Chef Charlie 100% deserved those Michelin stars, right? There's no question that he revolutionized the game. Did he revolve instead of evolve his entire career? I don't know. I really don't know. I don't think so. And then also, self-admittedly, he became a little bit of a tyrant to his staff and started treating people very differently. And he had a lot of failed marriages and relationships. And you've seen this, right? Like success in one area, but like life falling apart in every other area. Let's keep watching. When I was young, I was the type of entrepreneur that was hard to be around. I didn't create a pleasant work environment. Um, I was a bit arrogant. I drove people crazy because I was so driven and I lacked self-awareness. I lacked the ability to know how I was making people feel around me because I was so obsessed with the outcome and people would leave or quit. And I'd be like, I can't believe you're leaving. 
And and then I would find out later, like, well, no, two or three of them really didn't like you, man. Like, you just, you didn't thank them enough. You didn't praise them enough. So oftentimes, I've seen in the corporate world, and I think it's starting to wane a little bit, which is incredible, the notion that it took me blood, sweat, and tears to climb to the position that I'm at right now, and I don't have time for any of you measly little interns that don't know what it's like to walk a mile in the snow every day to the office and have to call people on landlines, fax things instead of email or text. And I think that that attitude for a long time was breeding more negativity than it was any kind of positivity in the workplace. Speaking from somebody that's worked in the corporate world for many years, I've seen the old guard and I've seen the changing of the guard, right? I've seen the leaders that come in now and they're like, you have to prioritize your mental health and your physical health. The job will take care of itself. If you're passionate about it and you care and you put the work in, you're not scoring points with the boss if you're checking in when you're on vacation with your family. Now, I know not every career is the same as that. I know that there are extenuating circumstances, but I can see the look in this guy's eye when he's talking about being being difficult to work for for many years, the high levels of expectations that people carry with them for their staff, it took them all of the hardships and pain and tribulations that they experienced to climb to the place that they ultimately got to. They're not going to hand over compliments as easily as somebody in the modern age where they realize complimenting your staff sometimes is more important than giving them a raise. Praise from the boss every now and then, saying, great job. I recognize how hard you work. You know, you really did well on this. You spoke well in that presentation or whatever the case is. It took those people very difficult pathways to get to the place that they were at so they ain't gonna hand over that stuff for free for people and in my opinion it's the wrong attitude to have i don't want to do a deal with somebody and i don't want to invest in an entrepreneur who hasn't been slapped in the face and i think that what i've noticed is that until somebody has the first season that they go through where they realize that they can make decisions in the right manner and still make the wrong decisions and still have forces outside of their business dictate what happens I think people will continue to fail because they they think they're untouchable. You can't you can't play God in your business. And I think a lot of people do get almost drunk on the power that they feel to the fact that they have created this environment where if they so choose, they can get everybody to only tell them good things and only tell them how good they are because they will punish people who don't. Nobody's invincible. Everybody will be wrong at some point in their lives. I'm constantly wrong all the time. The difference between people that, in my opinion, become successful, whether that's in a relationship, whether that's at a, in a business, whether that's an entrepreneur or at whatever company they work for, is that they're willing to look at themselves in the mirror and make the change immediately without emotion attached to it. So before I started in the music industry, I owned an ice cream company in New York City and it was so much fun. We were working 24 hours a day. It was so much, but I remember one pivotal moment. I was in the kitchen with my partner and we had a big vat, a big Cambro of tons and tons of unmixed, freshly made ice cream, a freshly made ice cream mixture. And it was super heavy. If anybody's ever held a Cambro before of really heavy liquid, it is not easy to pick up. You could be a very strong person, but when you're picking it up, it's sloshing all around and it's really, really, really heavy. So I picked it up and I thought I had a handle on it and I dropped it all over the floor. Now we were renting space in a commercial kitchen and at the time, time was a lot of money. So I looked over at my partner and she looked over at me and she had a straight look on her face. She almost had an indifferent look. My heart was pounding through my chest and she had a straight indifferent look. And the owner of the restaurant that we were producing at, all he said was, he looked right at me and he goes, let's clean it up. It's all good. Don't worry about it. And I'm like, are you sure? He was like, every second that passes right now is a second that you guys could clean up that mess and get right back to doing what you're doing. It's all good. These things happen. And that changed the way that I looked at it because I was so stressed and so angry at myself for doing that. How could I drop all of that? How could I lose all that money? And he had this fix it right now and worry about it later or don't even worry about it. Just keep it moving. And all of the best leaders I've worked for, including the current leader that I work for right now, lives his life and operates his life that way. I thought that was a really profound way that you worded that. What do you mean by that? Like respecting yourself with how you, how you behave or the decisions you make or the actions you take? I think that a lot of people nowadays blame others and they position every decision to leave a business or leave a job or leave a partner as this person is toxic. And, and I'm talking, I'm not talking about like abusive situation. I'm just saying generalized, right? I think it's become a very generalized term. Like this person's bad, toxic, all of these things. And I think at the end of the day, 
What I have realized has empowered me rather than stolen my power from me is to not ask, is this person bad or toxic? Is this job bad or toxic? But when I'm in this situation or when I'm around this person, do I respect myself more or less? Do I respect myself more or less if I go to the bar with single girls who invite me out that flirt with men? Less, so I don't hang out with them. Do I respect myself more or less if I allow an employee uh, to be in my company who does not embody our values and speaks poorly to people on my team? Less, so I, I cannot have them here, right? Do I respect myself more or less in my marriage, right? I respect myself more because I have a husband who promotes me, supports me, and, and would do anything to see me succeed. And so I think that there's just been this frame shift that's been in the last few years where I just see people blaming others for their problems, for the relationships in their life, for their situations. And at the end of the day, it's not about them because the reality is too, that guy that you know maybe you think is an a-hole that in your last relationship, there's some girl that would really like that. She just has different expectations, just being honest. And, and same with jobs. You know, there's some people who probably come work for me and say, this is just like way too much. It's terrible. It's toxic. Whereas like, I only hire people who see it as like, I will become a champion if I work here. And so I think at the end of the day, it all comes down to like our personal values and, and vision for ourselves. And the way that I center myself with that is just, do I respect myself more or less? Because at the end of the day, I cannot show up for my company. I can't show up to make content. I could not do this podcast if I don't respect myself. And so I will sacrifice, honestly, Ed, anything to keep that for me. Because since I was young, that is like the one thing that I have held on to. It's just like, I have wow. to respect myself. One of the oldest sayings in the book, right? If you know, if you're blaming everybody else, you have to look at yourself in the mirror and you might be the common denominator. I think that everybody that I've met that has done that 180 in their life where they've started living a better life, stopped blaming everybody else and started focusing on what they could control. And it sounds like Layla intuitively carries this with her every day, understands that if she's fixated on other people all the time and how they're bringing things down or up, she's not focusing on what she can do to control the situation. And honestly, I also want to say it's not about being a control freak. It's just about knowing what you can and can't do. So you can't control other people. And the harder you try, the worse you're going to feel. The more you try to play with other people's emotions and making them try to like you or making them try to be better employees or wish that they were better lovers or wish that they were better friends, usually you're going to be let down. You can only focus on how you react to things and what you bring to the table. So I think this is an excellent, excellent peer into it. What's your relationship with fear? I have an interesting one. I'll share mine after you. But like when I say fear to you, what, what thought do you have when I say that? Fear is always present when I'm doing something worth doing. That applies to everything, right? That applies to a musician that has butterflies in their stomach before they get on the stage. So they make sure that they are as well prepared as they could possibly be before they are, you know, performing. A chef in their team that's opening up a restaurant and consistently trying to put out the best product they can. There's a fear motivating that right there. They're not coasting. They're not thinking they've made it. They're not checking, checking out and maybe cutting the corners that some people might do in life when they feel like they don't want to put that work in. There's fear in the unknown, but confronting the unknown is what makes people stronger. So I don't remember what uh, Major League Baseball pitcher it was, but I do know that there are there are Major League Baseball players that have been known to put thumbtacks in their shoes when they were playing, so they felt a little uneasy the whole time, and they were able to uh, channel that that pain and discomfort into something really beautiful where they would it would motivate them a little better when they were on the mound so man i think that fear can cripple people if they're utilizing it and harnessing that energy the wrong way but again it seems like layla's really figured it out and you know and she gets into more of it later on but man it's a it's a beautiful thing when people can talk about how they can transmute their fear into something powerful and beautiful let's keep watching fear is just the unknown. Every time I feel scared, I just lean in. I just go right into it. And I just immerse myself in it. I'm like, we're going to be friends with fear today. <laughs> like mm. sometimes I literally imagine it, hearing it in my purse with me <laughs> because yeah. people say all the time, they, I'm sure you hear it too. They see the things that we're doing that are bold and they see the success and they think fear must not be present. And I'm like, no, no, no. 
Fear is present. I just also have courage, which is to act despite fear. I've realized that whether it be in my marriage, whether it be in relationships I have, whether it be in the business, the more that I just go head on into it, you train yourself and you teach your brain that that it's not something to be scared of. And so the irony is that the only way to rid yourself of fear is to just do the exact thing you are scared of. Whatever your fear is, there's your task, right? I don't know if any of you have seen Six Feet Under, and spoilers if you haven't for this, uh, for what I'm about to talk about, but there's a character in the show, David Fisher, played by Michael C. Hall. Beautiful character, an amazing performance from Michael C. Hall, by the way. And in one of the seasons, he is assaulted, and he is completely devastated from this assault that takes place from somebody that he trusted and went in with like more of like a naive sort of like a naive interaction and all the signs were there to not go down the path that he was going down but he went down that path and unfortunately it ended very tragically for him so over the course of the next couple of episodes David would have these crippling 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 panic attacks where he would have these visions and Six Feet Under was done in a very mis um, in a very whimsical way where whenever there would be like a daydream sequence or some sort of alternate reality sequence, you couldn't tell if it was real or if it was in the minds of the characters. It was brilliantly done. Uh, I honestly haven't seen any other TV show come close to doing it like that. Maybe The Sopranos a few times. There were a few scenes where David was being chased by this monster and it was a scary entity that was following him and trying to hurt him and he was waking up panicking and screaming and he didn't know what he was going to do it was ruining his life and eventually when he confronted the demon and the monster of course you all know what i'm about to say the demon and the monster was himself so this has been from the dawn of time what we are afraid of will hold us back if we are afraid to go out and forage for food for our families when we we're ancient you know cavemen we weren't going to provide for our families if we were afraid of going out and getting sick and being out in the real world, we might not find a mate and have a family, right? If we're afraid of sending that job application or taking that chance and uploading a YouTube video, right, with 10 subscribers, we are not going to put ourselves in a position where we can actually succeed. So it's easier said than done. I know when people are afraid, the last thing in the world they wanna hear is, oh, you gotta lean into that. But my response to that would be, how long have you been living and how many years of running from fear have you actually felt better from running from the fear? You might feel safe once the fear subsides because you're no longer putting yourself in that situ situation, but it's a revolving door. It's going to keep happening and coming back. And if anything, it's going to get worse and you could develop a lot of fear related anxiety disorders on top of that. Agoraphobia comes to mind, right? If you're afraid of leaving the house, over time, you are not going to leave your house and you could really live a very miserable life and a limited life. So I am a huge believer of do not let fear control you. To harness that into something beautiful and confront it. Because if you can confront it, you will be able to live your life in a completely different way. Layla, as she'll get into more and more in this podcast, did not get to this level of success by running away from her fears. When I run towards the boogeyman, it's like I almost I end up dancing with him a little bit. I'm like, all right, we're here. Let's just go. I've done this before. I'm built for this. We'll get through it. I'll learn something even if I'm not any good. And uh, it be, fear actually has created adrenaline in me that's got me to perform at a high level. Speaking's a great example of that. I'm afraid every time I speak. But when I run towards it, I go, I'm running into this fear. <sighs> Man, I'm loaded with like superhuman holy spirit adrenaline pumping through me and it's almost like this fear is somehow like a turbocharger on me when i hid from it which i hadn't done it was like kryptonite to superman almost right and what happened was i'm because i was hiding from it i made the problem bigger than it was when i run towards it it almost shrinks when i run towards it do you have that tendency at all? Or do you think people have that tendency to make problems bigger than they are? Wow. Okay. When I was in grad school, one of our incredible professors, Dr. Sandra Lee, told us a story about techniques that they would use on children 
when they were having nightmares. One of the techniques that they would use would be if they were having recurring dreams of like a monster, a lion or an animal or something that was attacking them. Instead of teaching these kids to run away from the fear of the lion that could be scary and wanted to hurt them, they would teach these kids or they would tell these kids, you know, if you actually look into the and look into the lion's face, you'll see that he's not angry with you. He's actually lonely and he's sad and wants a friend and he wants maybe a connection there. So that is such a useful way to reframe the fears that we have and turn it into something positive and put a spin on it instead of keeping the same story associated with what fear means. If we run away from fear all the time and don't look at it from a different perspective, we're always going to be seeing it from the same way and it's going to be crippling us and ruining us and eventually it's going to catch up to us. There's this phrase that I heard a long time ago and it stuck with me because I feel like it resonated so deeply, which was fear is a mile wide and an inch deep. And I have just never encountered a situation in my life where that has not been the case. That the moment that I see this, what it looks like this very ominous lake, right? Which is my fear. And I'm going to step in, I'm going to drown. It's like, I take the first step and then I realize it's like, it's just a puddle. Like that's mm. it. That's what's controlled my life for the last three years. Mm. I didn't make content for four years after Alex telling me to try and make it because I was so terrified of being judged online. I, I hate even saying that. It's embarrassing because it's like I literally can run a $100 million company, but I don't want to make content on Instagram, right? Um, but like the moment that I made it and I posted it for the first time, I was like, that literally degraded my, my self-respect for three years because when I avoid the things I'm scared of, I respect myself less. And the more aha moments you have like that, the easier it gets over time. When you have that data in your soul, in your psyche, you're able to say, okay, I've been here before. I've been afraid of this before and I've done this and it's worked out for me. So if I apply these same tactics, it's like strengthening any muscle, right? You're not going <laughs> to be able to bench press 400 pounds the first day you go into the gym unless you're some sort of freak in nature, right? You're gonna have to put the work in. You're gonna have to learn. You're gonna have to know exactly how your body responds to things. You're gonna be able to be a lot more resilient if you continue down that path and stay true to yourself that way. And so it all ties together. And the thing that I've come to realize, I'm like, every time something has started with fear, it has ended with confidence. And so when people want to know, how do I become more confident? You conquer your fears, like it's that simple. You I almost look at it like I'm collecting my fears and they're fueling me to be that confident person that I want to show up as. In order to have real confidence, you have to have humility. For me, where I get my confidence from is being able to accurately assess myself. That That's the, the one piece of it, right? I think the second piece is the reason that I have confidence is because of the things I do when nobody is watching, right? That then make me respect myself more. Especially nowadays when there's just so much noise out there and we get so much feedback the biggest thing i should say is like if if you're gonna believe all the hype when people are saying good things about you then you're also going to believe the hype when people say bad things about you and i think i also got really lucky ed because when i first started making content honestly it was pretty tough like i got terrible comments because my voice is very low as a woman all sorts of assumptions made for that and i had to deal with that before dealing with anyone clapping for me. Like I couldn't mm. see past, you know, people making videos about me, people making videos, breaking down, you know, are you a guy or a girl? Your voice is too low, like, what is it? And for me, I realized I was like, I am, I am making this content for myself, for the person I was when I started my last company, and I'm not going to let this stop me. One thing that's really helped me with stopping caring what other people have to say is moving in silence and working in silence. Layla just touched on it. She was judging herself up against herself, right? She wasn't putting herself out there constantly looking for praise from other people. It wasn't a motivating factor for her. Oftentimes, when we talk too much about what we're going to do or what we wish we should have done, we're, we're putting ourselves out there in a way where other people can easily infiltrate us. It's like saying, I don't want to come to the party because I have, and you start listing a million different things that you need to do. You're opening that person that's asking you to the party up to a million different ways to 
break those excuses wide open for you. Oh, you know, you don't have to work tonight. You could work tomorrow. You don't have to do the laundry today. You could do the laundry tomorrow or whatever it might be. And before you know it, you're saying yes to something that you might not really want to do in the first place instead of just saying, I don't want to, right? Or not saying anything at all. And I do believe this is a new shift that we're going to start to see where people moving in silence and being more results oriented. In the industry that I work, that are, those are the people that are respected the most. You move in silence, you get the job done, you're excellent at what you do, and you don't constantly talk about it and need the praise from other people. I'm not going to let this, the fact that like, I would wake up and I would see comments and I would start crying. And I, you know, and mm. I felt terrible for Alex. I'm like, I'm not, I don't cry, but like, it just felt awful. I'd never seen someone dehumanize somebody so much online. Completely ridiculous that people have to stoop to that level to look at other people's looks and to comment on their voice and to comment on things that they, you know, no idea what it's like to be that human being. And they do know deep down inside, they don't like themselves and that's why they're doing it. Anybody that's ever put somebody down for the way that that somebody else looks or sounds or is, if those people are earnest and they're really working hard and they're making a difference in the world, the people that are talking smack about those people are truly the ones that have stuff to work on, not the people that might have a little bit of a deeper voice or are a little self-conscious about how they look, okay? Awful thing to do to somebody Internet is ripe with things like that. Nothing is more common on the internet than people sitting behind screens and talking smack about other people. But it's a shame that she had to see that. But it's also something's telling me that motivated her into the person she is today. My son said to me the other day, he's like, Dad, you're confident because when you get out there and you speak, man, they just go crazy. I go, no, actually, I'm confident because I know the hundreds of hours I put in to prepare that message. I know what I've thought about every word I've said, every story I tell, how I link it. In the gym, it's not that, hey, you've got big muscles, look good. It's like, I know when no one's watching, I do the extra rep. I know the days when my foot hurt, I still did cardio. It's not the public praise, it's the thing you say. It's the quiet, ugly thing I do that no one's gonna see. That's my confidence. Move in silence, right? Nobody benefits from constant praise or from looking for constant praise and getting drips and drabs of it. And if you think you're benefiting from that, try it the way that these two successful people are living their lives. See how that changes your life. It is a game changer when you stop doing things for other people and you start doing things for you. Let me ask you this about, you said something about too, about mental health. This is, this is deep, I've never heard this before. We confuse how we feel with mental health. I was like, whoa, what is that all about? Listen to this, everyone, right here. Because mental health is like this super common vogue topic everywhere. Watch your mental health. Watch your mental health, right? So talk about this. Guys, watch this. Here we go. When I was 18, I felt angry and depressed. And so my parents said, we should send you to a psychiatrist. So they sent me to a psychiatrist. I met with him for 20 minutes. He asked me a series of questions. One of which, like, do you have more energy on the weekends? Do you feel, how do you feel during the week? Obviously, I have more energy on the weekends than on school. <laughs> um, mm. Useless questions. And I got done with the 20-minute call, and they sent, like, an email with a receipt, and they had diagnosed me with five disorders. And then they said, take these medications. We sent them to the pharmacy. And I called my dad, and I was like, no. There's nothing wrong with me. Like, it makes sense that I'm angry. It makes sense that I'm depressed. Look at the circumstances. My mother tried to kill herself in front of me. And then I had to separate mm. from her. Of course I'm angry and depressed. Why does that mean that there's something wrong with me? And so, honestly, Ed, like, my entire life has felt like everybody has said there is something wrong with you. Except the people who are where I want to be. They have all said... You should take a break. You shouldn't do this. If it doesn't feel right to you, don't do it. Every time I do what feels right to me, I succumb to my fears. Because what feels good and what is good for somebody are two completely different things. Yes, there's days I don't want to come into the office and record content for six hours or seven hours or whatever it may be, and then also do an event and speak there. But I'm not going to say, oh, you know what? I need a self-care day to take a bubble bath. Because a lot of times I think people conflate self-care with avoidance. Most of my adult life has been unlearning the things that I think I heard in traditional media and on the news and reading on blogs and like people say them as jokes. Like 
I don't think it's funny. I don't think it's funny that people want to take, honestly, days of their life off. They need to go get drunk every weekend, do a bubble bath, do a martini this, like Taco Tuesday. Like that to me is sad because they feel good in all the short-term moments. But long-term, they create dysfunction in their lives. And so like I will sacrifice short-term comfort and trade that for long-term having a functional life any day. Absolutely, hands down. I have a lot of people in my life, in high school and in college and after college and eating like crap and not working out or maybe taking care of themselves here and there. You know, there are, there are people that I know that are my age and even older that are in better shape than most of the people that I see. And I live in a very, very conducive area for people to be in incredible shape here in Southern California. So it's really interesting. The people that succumb to temporary, what whatever it is, mouth pleasure with food or comfort pleasure with avoidance of something, those are the people that long-term are not strengthening those long-term muscles to be able to put up with the longevity of the career that they want to be in or the dream that they want to live. And that is why people usually fail at what they're trying to accomplish because they don't have that strength of a lifestyle. Because remember, willpower is exhaustive, right? So if you have all of your strength is relying on something and you give up on it, you're gonna, that feeling of relief can be intoxicating for, for some people. And Layla touched on it with, you know, today's just a self-care day. I don't want to do anything. You have enough of those days strung together, then guess what? You're living a very avoidant life. And those are the kind of people that are the ones that fall by the wayside and they don't reach their potential and reach their goals. But I think mm. that we have conflated this and we have just turned avoidance into something that is normal and okay. And I just am so against that because it does not help anybody's mental health. If we wanted to help people's mental health, we would teach them not to be scared of their feelings. We would teach them that it's okay to feel depressed if somebody dies. It's okay to feel depressed if you lost a job. It's okay to feel angry if somebody wronged you. And it's okay to be in school when you're growing up and not being able to pay attention in class where they're sitting you down and teaching you things that you're not even remotely interested in learning and you have problems going on at home and then they're telling you that you need to take a pill in order to make it all go away. And the psychiatrists are building your family and the insurance companies and they're making money off of it and they're charging tons and tons and tons and tons of money around the world and it's a huge business and it's wrong and Layla didn't have any problems that were going to be fixed with medication when she was a child she needed people to say it's okay it's okay we love you no matter what we believe in you no matter what and I grew up in the Ritalin Adderall era of every kid having ADHD and guess what I don't think any of them had ADHD I think all of them had traumas going on at home and things that were happening in their lives that were preventing them from being the best whatever that this means student that they could be sitting in a fifth grade class trying to learn multiplication. You think you're obsessed and is obsession bad? Talk about obsession for a minute. Like I think my obsess, I am obsessed with uh, helping people. I'm obsessed with um, being more successful. I'm obsessed with growing. I happen to think those are relatively healthy obsessions. What you're being told by people is it's not so healthy. But do you think, are you obsessed and do you think it's healthy? Yes, I am obsessed. And I would say I also err on the side of I can be compulsive with my obsessions. Uh, I just find ones that work in my favor. So, you know, I think a lot of the times, you know, I mean, for sure, obsessive compulsive, like I've had like 17,000 people tell me I am that. Um, and I'm like, great, a superpower. Like, what's wrong with that? Like, I get obsessed and I will reach my goal no matter what. Like, I have shown myself that time and time again. And so I actually just think that I look at the difference between, you know, a lot of the times I think, for example, like people have a parent and that parent does something that hurts them or has something wrong with them. You know, for example, like my mother, you know, she ended up getting into drugs and alcohol and we don't have a relationship. And I think because I have a lot of the same tendencies my mother had, I have very similar way of talking. She was very bright. She was very driven and she used it the wrong way. She was taught that it was bad. She did not fuel any of her life. Like she decided to just be a stay at home mom and not work. She didn't like, she did not unleash this and use it as a power. And I think that if I look at, you know, like a hero and a villain, it's just like, what do you use your power for? Yeah. Like, yes, I'm obsessed, but I use it to make the world better. 
And so mm. is it even bad if it makes my life and others better that I am obsessive and sometimes compulsive? No, it's not bad. Oftentimes we are running away from that fearful word of, man, you're obsessive over this and come on, you, you gotta live your life, right? What Layla is talking about are other people's interpretations, right? It's back to what she talked about earlier. Other people, the praise, the, the put downs, it doesn't matter to her. She's sticking on the plan that she's on because it's working for her and she loves it. So if other people are calling her obsessive if from, a, from a negative standpoint, well, she's not going to allow those people in their lives, I'm assuming. And if she's close enough with those people, she might even tell them, or at least I would say this, yes, I'm obsessive with it because I love it. And it's something that works for me. And I choose to harness this energy that I have in this capacity, whereas other people choose to harness the energy that they have in other capacities. How many people do you know that like to wake up early? And how many people do you know that like to go out and stay out super late, right? Rarely are those two, two of the same kind of people, right? Everybody in the world is different. I think the term obsessive compulsive disorder is loosely thrown around. People are doing themselves a disservice if they're listening to people saying, you're so obsessive and they know that it's working for them in their lives and it's actually stopping them from doing what they want to do. Mm -hmm. I have those two. I have a couple, I think I am obsessive compulsive. Like I'll do certain things where I'm not washing my hands, but there's little things I'll do. And I'm like, I probably, it's not healthy that I do this. And what I, do you do that at all? Do you have any like weird quirks that if everybody knew what they were, they would think you were a weirdo. Do you have any of that? Any of you listening or do you Layla? Oh yeah. Well, I mean, I like, I cannot not wash my hands after I go to the bathroom. Alex knows that. And he, right. he's like, what? Uh, and like have to shower before I get in bed. I will not get I will not go into bed dirty. Mm -hmm. That's disgusting. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But also just like around work, <laughs> you know, like, mm -hmm. yes, goodness, like when you talked about like one more rep, I literally have yep. this notch in my brain and it's probably, and it's like, if you don't do extra reps, you can't leave. It's like, that's exactly have me to. too. It's not too. like a choice. And I like, I won't yep. do them. And then I have to like, I like come back into the gym and do them. <laughs> and then so I, do I, it's just like a rule that I have made for myself. And this is the thing. I think a lot of the times we get obsessed with something and we create rules that work in our favor to achieve a goal. So I also like to wash my hands after I use the bathroom. I also like to shower at night before going to bed because I can't get into bed feeling gross and dirty. And to touch on the extra rep part, I have been doing jujitsu for two and a half years now. It is one of my favorite things in the world that I've ever done. And it's funny because the first time that I tried doing it at a different academy, before I found the academy that I'm at right now that I love more than anything, I didn't want to stick around for very long. I wanted to do the fundamentals and I would leave and I would always leave when I would watch a lot of the students and the, and the professors on the mat live training and going over more specific stuff after class. And now in the current academy that I'm at, I can't leave in good conscience if I haven't given myself or left it all on the mat that night which means sometimes I'll stay for two classes in a row and two, two parts of rolling sessions, which is a lot. And I'll do two, sometimes three, whereas a year or two ago, I was only doing one, if that. So I think it's all cumulative and it adds up over time. If you start living your life in all of the ways that they've talked about in this podcast, you're gonna start to find yourself more energetic to be able to do that final rep and even if you think you can't, you know you can because you've done it before. And it starts to become non-negotiable for you. And it starts to become a lifestyle rather than just being willpower, laying on the couch, eating potato chips, feeling like crap and thinking, oh, I don't have any energy to go to the gym. Maybe going to the gym once and then getting sore and not wanting to go back. It's a vicious cycle. But if you can get to a place where you're comfortable and you know who you are and you love who you are, then it's golden. You're golden. What yeah. happens is that if that if that obsession and that rule is no longer serving you and you cannot break it, I would say then it's probably something we want to take care of. I'm not even going to say a problem, just like it's not helping your life get better. Um, and so for me, it's always looking at like, well, does having this rule in my mind make me better or worse? And some people have rules that make them worse, which I think that's fair. Then look at that. But a lot of people are able to engineer a life where they're obsessed with something and they create rules that allow them to succeed. And I think I have done that and I've just tried to yield all of my force rather than like putting my mental energy into things that don't matter into just like, how do I do that to achieve my goals? 
So one rule my wife and I have, which is something that we just sort of, it just sort of happened. And I think I have to credit her with coming up with the term for it. But we have seasons of life that we're in. And right now, the season of life that we are currently in, we are not very social. We're not out and about all the time, hanging out with tons and tons of people. I, I work in a very social job. So by the time I get home, the last thing in the world I really want to do is socialize with a bunch of other people. And my wife is an entrepreneur. She's at home and she's growing her business. And as we are working really hard together, separately and together, we've both realized if we're not hanging out with people that really enhance our dreams in life and quality of life in a better way, then no offense to those people, but we're not going to say yes to things that aren't suiting us right now. And sometimes it can feel, especially from the outside, if you open yourself up to other people's judgments, that we're being weird for not being social or we really should say yes to more social things. But if it's not moving us forward, it's actually moving us backward, right? It doesn't mean we're going to be that way forever. It doesn't mean that we're going to be antisocial. There's a big difference between being antisocial and knowing what's working for you and knowing what doesn't work for you in the season of life you're in. So I think that that's incredible. I think so many people struggle with that. And I don't know how many people are really talking about it. I'd love to make a video on that one day too. So. so do I. And by the way, all of you that are listening to this, some of these little things that could be borderline obsessive compulsive can also be triggers that put you in a place to perform. So is it comp obsessive compulsive when a baseball player unties their batting gloves three times before they get in the batter's box? Or, or is that a trigger that puts them in the right state? And so those of you that tend to see to have a little bit of that, you're right on the line of being mega successful because those are triggers. If you, The healthy way to do it is a trigger. The unhealthy way is it becomes compulsive. Those of you that have a tendency to be addictive personalities, alcohol, drugs, gambling, whatever it is, do you know how damn close you are to being successful? Because you have the brain of a successful person. If you can redirect those compulsions and obsessions in a healthy place, you can change the world and change your world. So those of you that think you're all screwed up, you're a millimeter away from being mega successful with a tweak or two that we're talking about here today. So absolutely awesome stuff. I didn't know we were going to talk about it. Awesome stuff. Okay, shift. Let's talk about leaders for a minute. Did you want to say anything about that? Did you have a thought? You look like you wanted to say something. All I was going to say, Ed, is for anyone who doesn't believe what you said, I was arrested six times. <laughs> and <laughs> Wow. So, wow, wow. I'm glad you just said that. Go ahead. Finish that thought, please. No, I mean. That I didn't know. That when I was younger, I was arrested six times for alcohol and drugs. I was drinking all the time. I was doing drugs. And that was between the age of nine, of 18 to 19. Like there was an 18 month period where I allowed myself to indulge in the wrong direction. And that's what I realized is like, there's nothing wrong with being obsessed. You're using it on the wrong things. Somebody that is like that. And I would say like, I identify as like, I don't even say like, I'm like, I'm a hunter is what I actually identify as. I'm like, I want to hunt. And so when you don't have something to hunt, you get yourself into trouble. And I don't think that somebody who's born that way, it, I mean, it's probably, maybe it's rare that I'm a female and feel that way about myself, but um, like, you should not suppress that because that just yes. makes it worse. And so yes. what I see is that when people try to suppress these things that they are naturally gifted with, and then they're told mm -hmm. are wrong, they go in this direction, which is what I went in. And it took me yeah. just saying, screw what everyone's told me, what works for me? And what works for me is actually the opposite of what everyone has said. And so just yes. for anybody who thinks that, like I was that person and I am now where I am. It's not like something fundamentally inside of me changed. It's that I put it in the right direction. <laughs> I now have it working for me, not against me. I'm sorry if any of you think that Layla or or this gentleman are superhuman people, lizard creatures from you know another planet and they're superhuman and that's why they're able to do what they're doing and that's why they're as successful as they are, but they are not. Every single person is capable of doing something great. I really do believe that. And if we harness who we are, in the right directions, in the directions illustrated in this amazing podcast that I really do believe everybody should see, then we're on the right track. But if we let other people decide the life that we want to live and doubt ourselves all the time and run away from our fears and think, man, I am just broken. I'm always destined to live in this terrible apartment. I could never afford that. I'll never get promoted. You're probably going to stay stuck most of your life. And I've been around a lot of people, including family members that have talked that way. And it's probably one of the reasons I'm so 
so adamant ab about being against that and about being the opposite and living and shooting for your dreams and actually taking the correct steps to get there and not doubting yourself. I think that what I've realized over time is if I look at how I am now, which I would say I'm the most effective of a leader I've ever been and how I was when I began, the discrepancy between the two is my ability to speak to the person. And I think this is a this is a phrase that many people hear. It's like, speak to the person that you're with, meaning how can I speak in a way that they actually understand the message I'm delivering? And mm. so what I realized in the beginning is I would speak because I'm, I naturally just really like people and I love having a team and I like being a, a leader, like I just do. And so if anyone messes up, I don't yell at them. I'm like, hey, like, what was going on? Are you okay? Like, I'm, I'm checking in. And I start to realize, I'm like, you know, that style doesn't land with everybody. And honestly, it was just environmental feedback. I started realizing, you know, if I speak to this guy who's on my team, who was in the Navy for five years and then worked at, you know, Bain and McKinsey, uh, like that, he doesn't even hear a word I said. And so I realized if I want to expand my capacity as a leader, I have to expand my ability to adapt to the person in front of me. So I've spoken about this before. My boss that I work for currently got through to me in this exact way. He spoke to me as a human being. He looked at me and he said, you're a national champion college baseball player that opened up an ice cream company that is in the music industry. You have instincts, use them, go with your instincts. I'd rather you go for it with your passion and your drive that you have than second guess yourself because you're afraid of what you might fail or afraid of other people might think. And that completely changed my life in one sentence. It hurt, it was scary, it was a gut punch, but it was also motivating and I left that meeting with him feeling like I was on top of the world. And I truly remember when I was young and I was 24 and had like 110 employees at the time. And I remember doing one-on-ones. I think I had 11 direct reports and I was doing all of them in a day. And I, I had this cue, which was, I had a hat next to me and I was reminding myself with each one-on-one -on -one to put on a different hat. That doesn't mean that my values change. That doesn't mean that Layla changes, but it may mean that the tonality I use and the expressions that I have change. A great leader is gonna to talk to their employees different case by case, right? Exactly what Layla's talking about. She's not talking to every single employee the same way that my boss talked to me, because that would just be kind of cutting corners and checking out and it wouldn't be doing it it wouldn't be doing a service to the people that need the actual conversations the right way and that's because it's more important to me to communicate the message than how it gets there i don't care how it gets there and at the end i really don't um i just want to make sure that it's heard by that person in the way that i intend it to and i think it's very hard to do that if you don't have the skill of adapting to the person in front of you i totally agree um what's an exit feel like Let's take us into that her and her husband have had an exit where they have that day. I asked him at dinner that night because I've I know what it's like, but I think most people listening to this dream of a day where all their hard work, someone comes along and values it enough that maybe they buy their company, they have an exit of some type. And I remember my first friend I was playing golf with, first guy I ever met that had an exit. His name was Roger. And uh he didn't even own the company. He was like the number two or three guy there, but he got a big exit. And I said, What's it like? And I remember he put his golf club down. He goes, bro, it was amazing. I kept checking the bank. Is it really in there? Oh my God. Goes, as good as you think it is. It's a million. I'm just curious for you. What was your, yeah. what was the first exit? Like, what does it feel like when that day happens? Most entrepreneurs dream of. Very unimportant. Hmm. I don't even think about it. Lifestyle over conditional happiness. Doesn't mean that all entrepreneurs that make zillions of dollars are living that exact lifestyle. I gotta say, there's a huge difference between somebody that's working, working, working so hard, hoping for that big payout one day, and somebody else that's just living to their true lifestyle, who they are as a human being, loving what they're doing every day, not affected by the money. The money's great, the money's a motivating factor, don't get me wrong, but you saw the look in her face. The money hitting the bank account truly felt like nothing to me. And I, I like can't, I, I don't think it's like that for everybody, but I think something, whether it be for better or worse, is money's never been my number one priority. Like when I met Alex, he was like, if you could just, just like, not just wanna help people as much as you do and be so obsessed with all this, but also be okay making money, he's like, you'll be dangerous. 
And so <laughs> I've had to balance out, and I think he balances me out a lot with also focusing on the monetary aspect, but I don't get, you know, like having an extra, whatever, $45 million, like the only thing that I looked at it as is a tool. And I think for a lot of people, they get really excited when they see more money, but I don't know if they know what it means. And mm -hmm. I think they suddenly think like, oh, because I have all this money, that means I should stop working. And it means I'm not going to want to work anymore. And mm -hmm. I actually think that it's not true for most people. And what I saw with most of my friends before we had our exit was people who didn't have a plan for what to do after they exited their business were very depressed. Yep. Because you think about it. Why do people run businesses? Because we get good things from it. It makes us feel good. It gives us status. It gives us money. It gives us attention from employee, like all of these different things. And suddenly you take it all away. And then they start putting all this pressure onto the, on their, their spouse and on their friends. And like, now they need it from somewhere else. And so if yeah. you don't replace that with something else, you probably just mess up everything for everyone else around you because you're asking more of everybody. And they're like, nothing's changed for me. And so mm. for me, it honestly is just not something I think about a lot because it was just a tool. And at the end of the day, I don't even look um, uh, at like our personal money right now because I'm only thinking about acquiring more money to build bigger things, not to like fuel my shopping. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. That is a beautiful thing that Layla just said. Mo money is not her motivating factor. She just enjoys the process of working and becoming a better version of herself in her business and in her personal life. Something tells me that if we could all harness that level of intuition and that level of experience, then the world would be a better place because I think people would be less conditionally happy and more satisfied, a more satisfied mind, a more satisfied life. I'm hoping that I've introduced the world, you know, I know a lot of the world knows you, but the part that didn't, I'm grateful that I got to introduce you to them and vice versa, because this was outstanding today. So thank you so, so much. It was awesome today. Thank I'm you really for grateful. having me. This was hands down one of my favorite podcasts I've ever seen. I thought I knew a lot about Layla and Alex Hermosi before watching this podcast, but it truly, I learned so much about the two of them, about her, about Ed, about their dynamics in life and what it takes to be a successful person and how you transmute mental health into something beautiful, how you could live your true self in life despite what other people think. You're not being selfish by doing it. You're being successful. And I think the whole world would benefit from listening to this podcast and listening to the two of these people open up about who they are as people. So I think oftentimes in the world, especially with the line of work that Alex and Layla are in, you're seeing snippets of how to be the best productive person or how to run a business or how to do something with a multi-million dollar company. And it's not as relatable and no offense to them. It's just not as relatable when you see those clips or you believe that you're not good enough because of your trials and tribulations that you've experienced or you are experiencing. So I hope that this has been, you know, something fun. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did enjoy, please let me know in the comments and I'll continue to make more things like this. I'm just starting out. I have no idea what I'm doing, but I'm just making things that are very interested in. So the content might be all over the place, but I know that I'll have fun continuing to do things like this. Have a great day. I believe in you. I promise you that you can do it even if you believe that you can't. This world is filled with opportunity and all of the people that we watch that we just saw on the screen started from nothing as well. So I hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.